I'd um, like to specifically focus, I suppose, on the uh, um, nature of heritage and development intervention in in a sense, which has kind of been there, been a kind of presence in many of the papers. But I'd like to address that a little bit more explicitly. Um, and uh, I'd like to step back, as it were, from the uh, the fascinating kind of case examples that we've been uh, hearing about to a kind of a broader context, um, and specifically on this pairing, as it were, or perhaps contradiction that's been present, um, again, implicitly and sometimes explicitly in the papers between development and, and, and heritage. Um, and I'd like to base these, um, my talk, really on some arguments that uh, emerged out of a conference um, which was entitled Museums, Heritage and International Development that we actually organised at the Tropa Museum in Amsterdam a couple of years ago and which has recently been published uh, in this edited volume. And I've got a couple of uh, uh, them with me if anyone wants to have a look at later and there's some discount uh, uh, leaflets too there. Um, in this book, um, uh, it's an edited volume, lots of case examples also, many of which are specifically addressing African heritage challenges, but um, also um, a much broader range of geographical context too. And um, the point was made earlier about the particular issues facing African countries, but actually many of those problems are common outside of Africa too, so we shouldn't forget that. I also just want to expand on that little plug and say that this is the first in a series, a new book series, called Routledge Studies in Culture and Development. And just to say that um, we'd very much welcome proposals for monographs or edited volumes within this collection, specifically in this field of culture and development. So if you have a book project you'd like to discuss, um, please do, um, do get in, in contact. <clears throat> Just before I start, I want to just explain, I've got a rather dull, um, on, the, on the one hand, a dull set of PowerPoint things. I'm kind of mapping on the one hand what, uh, what I'll try and cover in my little talk. On the left-hand side, though, to introduce a little bit of ethnographic detail, I've got some pictures from um, my own research in Sierra Leone. Um, often when I um, do work with a community, one of the first things we do is to meet in the court barrier, like the meeting place in the centre of any... Uh, village or town or it might be under the shade trees or on someone's veranda and um, it's a place where um, a lot of discussion happens um, and um, a lot of discussion talk about community history about heritage and so on um, and quite often um, we do a kind of a process of trying to map that you we were talking earlier about uh, defining heritage and uh, one of the things I've always been very interested to try and do working with different communities is to try and understand what their heritage landscapes in the broadest sense of that are like. So I'm trying to assert some kind of parallel here between trying to map out some kind of territory and I'll try and map out some kind of um, questions um, in, in, in what I talk about too, in, in putting that into a broader context. Uh, apologies for reading, but otherwise I shan't get through it. So in the wake of the UN World Decade for Cultural Development, which ended in 1997, there was a spate of interest among development scholars, including economists, in cultural dynamics. And we heard a little bit about that in relation to the, uh, the World Bank earlier. Well, aspects of this cultural turn have become incorporated into mainstream development discourse. And I shall be talking quite a lot about institutional uh, kind of cooperation or intervention projects, both from heritage organisations and development organisations, NGOs, etc. Um, so whilst this cultural, uh, aspects of this cultural tone have become incorporated into mainstream development discourse, the degree to which this has transformed development practice is debatable. And the lack of continued reflection on these issues has been disappointing. At the same time, sorry, at the same time, although in relative terms investment is small, as this conference has demonstrated, there is an, uh, a, in fact a remarkable amount of work being done bridging the fields of, of heritage and development, and not least, of course, in um, countries across Africa. 
Aside from the generation of tourism revenue, the focus tends to be on the instrumental value of heritage as an agent of social cohesion, intercultural dialogue and human well-being. One of the challenges here is that while heritage advocates are convinced of the social value of heritage, they lack the hard evidence to demonstrate this convincingly within the economistic models that the development sector uses to measure efficacy. And indeed, these, these are as true in the UK, these issues, as they are in different African countries. I was just at a meeting yesterday with uh, English Heritage talking about precisely the same issue. We also know that there's nothing inherently positive about heritage. It's not some kind of panacea. And as we know, it can take on deeply conservative forms and may be a divisive form that contributes to intolerance and conflict. Understood as the active presence of the past in the present, however, heritage is a simple fact. An inheritance that has the power to shape individuals and society's current predispositions and their visions of the future, for good or ill. So here, then, I'm taking the position of the, the heritage agnostic, a little bit like Marika was saying there, this deep ambivalence, um, and also this kind of, on the one hand, being someone who lives and breathes the academic critique of heritage, and on the other hand, tries to uh, work on policy issues and the implementation, and those are deeply you know, opposing, often, uh, sides to, to inhabit. Um, and so in this paper, my interest is in exploring how a pairing of heritage and development provides an opportunity for reflecting on both. So this notion of heritage and development as paired opposites. Culture, and especially traditional culture, has often been perceived as being in opposition to development and understood as a barrier to progress. Discussing the intellectual heritage of development, Emma Crewe and Elizabeth Harrison observe, and I quote, the idea of tradition holding people back has a persistence across the development industry. Developers talk and write about traditional ways of life, the traditional relationship between husband and wife, traditional skills, the traditional three stone fire, and traditional farming practices. This traditionalism is partly attributed to economic or ecological conditions, but is often conceived as being linked to a psychological or cultural disposition that is in some sense backward and prevents people from embracing modernity." End of quote. While we might not define cultural heritage narrowly in terms of traditionalism, it is nevertheless apparent that heritage and development are often framed in this manner as paired opposites. Communities or societies may either be open to processes of change and modernization, or else they are enthralled by inherited cultural practices and attitudes that prevent them from developing and that keep them, in, keep them mired somehow in the past. Culture, notes Arjuna Pajarai, is opposed to development as tradition is opposed to newness and habit to calculation. It is hardly surprising, this is a Pajarai still, hardly surprising that nine out of ten treatises on development treat culture as a worry or a drag on the forward momentum of planned economic change. This kind of binary logic has, of course, been thoroughly critiqued, not least in the development studies literature. Simple dichotomies that oppose development and developing, donors and beneficiaries, rich and poor, first world and third world, tradition and modern, um, while still fundamental to much development thinking, are now acknowledged to be oversimplifications that obscure the complexities of political and social realities. While his critique has led many to reject such dualisms outright and has encouraged to turn to more nuanced ethnographic analyses of development practices and encounters, others have rendered these discursive formations as ethnographic objects in their own right. Drawing upon John Law's insight that dualisms are not immutable givens within the world, but achievements brought about through forms of ordering that entail particular social practices, Thomas Yarrow, argues that rather than, rather than abandoning them completely, attention should focus on their discursive possibilities and practical effects within the world, whether positive or negative. Rather than merely exposing these discursive forms as artifice, Yarrow's, uh, Yarrow argues, uh, urges rather, um, he urges us to examine the role that these oppositions perform and the meanings and uses that they acquire in different contexts. Following Yarrow, then, here I refrain from abandoning the antithetical logic of heritage and development, 
and rather think through this particular oppositional pairing to explore the work that it, it, it performs. In staging such a conversation between what appear to be oppositional temporalities and values, and I'll be focusing on those two dynamics, the expectation is not that the differences between heritage and development will dissolve or be exposed as illusory, but they may have a mutually destabilising effect on each other, which may yet be productive. So, development temporalities, heritage temporalities. Discursively, cultural heritage and development would seem to occupy quite distinct temporalities. The very word development connotes future orientation, synonymous with concepts of advancement, change, evolution and progress. Heritage, conversely, suggests an orientation towards the past, to that which has gone before, invoking notions of tradition, nostalgia, preservation, decay and perhaps obsolescence. Despite the profound critiques of James Ferguson, Arturo Escobar and other so-called post-development theorists, the evolutionary worldview from which modern development thinking emerges continues to undergird much contemporary development policy and practice. There remains an idea that the world is divided into advanced, progressive, developed states and those that are somehow backward, undeveloped and in need of assistance in order to catch up. As the anthropologist Maya Green and colleagues have recently argued, development interventions depend on particular notions of time and progress that assume universal trajectories in which certain people and places are left behind and have to be brought into a future modernity. With its technologies of project management, strategic planning and budgetary frameworks, development may thus be understood as an instrument in future making. This is Maya Green's argument. At the same time as Umar Qatari has argued, in its failure to acknowledge its own colonial heritage, the development industry has tended to reproduce, or at, less, uh, or at best, merely rework relationships, perceptions and attitudes of empire. Thus new forms of inequality overlay historical inequalities, and the development industry, through its normative frameworks, policies and practices, all too often prescribes the futures that its beneficiaries should aspire to ignoring the steps and strategies that people use to imagine and realise their own futures. Continuities with attitudes of empire may also be found in the allochronism or denial of coevalness inherent in the ideology of international development. Whereas terms such as undeveloped, traditional and backward have replaced the colonial nomenclature of primitive, savage and aboriginal, the tendency to equate spatial or cultural difference with temporal distance is common to both colonial and development thinking. Whether aid develop beneficiaries or colonial subjects, both are relegated to an earlier state than the erstwhile imperial powers and still the major don uh, uh, aid donors of, of Western Europe and North America perceive themselves to have long superseded. While 19th century social evolutionist ideologies regarding native peoples of the colonial periphery as evolutionary relics, throwbacks from a prehistoric age, the development industry has adopted its own evolutionary schemas along which the global poor have yet to progress. Thus, Rostow's classic formulation of the five stages of economic growth plots the steps through which a traditional society must progress and mature in order to achieve an age of high mass consumption, and those are his formulations. Others chart the societal transformations Associate, associated with different stages in the so-called human development sequence. As Qatari notes, such temporal imaginings are mapped onto contemporary spatialities too, creating the socio-temporal dislocations between first and third worlds, in incarcerating whole populations in categories of relative backwardness and excluding them from the global future as determined and represented by the neoliberal West. In relation to heritage, it's interesting to note that the agents of modernisation and development in both colonial and post-colonial eras have had a somewhat ambivalent relationship to their own transformative projects. Historically, the corollary of the colonialist civilising mission, which sought to deliver primitive peoples from their savage state, was a nostalgia for the very lifeways that it would make extinct. 
virtually every other word in which I'm coming out with here needs to be in inverted commas, so I'll, I apologise for not putting them all there explicitly. Um, here then we find <clears throat> the emergence of a discourse of endangerment, which was key to the expansion in the mid-19th century of anthropology as a, as a discipline charged with the task of salvaging the last vestiges of savage life and savage culture before it disappeared forever before the onward march of so-called civilization. And these are the words of the anthropologist, early 20th century anthropologist Northcote Thomas, uh, for instance. For Thomas and other anthropologists of that era, the subject races of empire were, quote, a living memorial to the past, whose archaic way of life was destined for extinction, never to be recovered. The likes of Thomas argued that if these traditional societies were to be sacrificed in the name of progress, then it was incumbent upon the imperial powers to collect, document and record what su survived of them before it was too late. Thus began the frenzy of collecting, not only of objects, but also of languages, customs, laws, practices, performance, and all manner of anthropometric data, which would go on to fill countless museum stores and displays, and which characterised the late 19th and early 20th century anthropological project. A related discourse of endangerment was articulated in relation to the damage being wrought by colonial development on both the natural and built heritage in other colonial contexts. This led to the passing of laws designed to protect and preserve cultural and natural heritage in many overseas territories, and quite often before equivalent legislation was introduced in, the, in, the, uh, the, 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 in Europe, in the metropolitan centres. In 1900, for example, anticipating the passage of India's 1904 Ancient Monuments Preservation Act, Viceroy Lord Curzon acknowledged that in its pursuit of imperial ambitions, Britain had presided over an era of vandalism in India, which had seen many of the subcontinent's architectural treasures damaged or destroyed. It was, he argued, the responsibility of an enlightened government to protect such antiquities. In contrast to ethnologi ethnological salvage, the emphasis... The emphasis here was not on documenting a fast vanishing, prim vanishing primitive way of life, so much as saving the monumental remains of civilizations that were perceived to be already extinct, civilizations to which the new imperial powers regarding the, regarded themselves as, uh, as worthy inheritors. If development may be construed as an instrument of future making, heritage, of course, could be regarded as an instrument is, uh, in, of, in past making. While conventionally identified with the vestiges of the past itself, the monuments and relics protected by antiquities legislation, or the primitive technologies assembled in so many ethnological collections, like development, heritage is also an industry and an ideology. And as with development, heritage is both a product of Western modernity and a constituent part of that modernity. As is evident in the context of salvage ethnography and architectural preservation, the valorization of the past typically emerges when the past is perceived to be endangers, endangered, not least through the very processes of modernization and development. Thus, the French historiographer Pierre Nora writes of the rupture of equilibrium that accompanies the transition from an archaic social world uh, in which life is lived, and these are his words, lived in the warmth of tradition, in the silence of custom, in the, and in the repetition of the ancestral, to a forgetful modernity propelled by change, in which, quote, we speak so much of memory because there is so little of it left. With the onset of modernity, Nora ar argues, um, an immense and intimate fund of memory disappears, and this is reconstituted and materialised at deliberately created, self-consciously commemorative sites, such as museums, archives, festivals, anniversaries and monuments. Here then we see the rise of heritage and the modern veneration of the trace, an era in which the past is valued primarily for no other, re no other reason than that it is past. Heritage is a notoriously malleable concept and we've seen a great deal of that uh, today. While some are troubled by the semantic promiscuity of the term, this lack of precise definition need not be a negative quality. And the fact that heritage is invoked so often in such a variety of contexts is itself telling. Certainly one may identify an array of distinct temporal associations in the various conceptualizations of heritage employed by different agencies and other actors and stakeholders. 
One might note, for instance, the distinct heritage temporalities articulated in conceptualising heritage, as I've written up here, um, respectively as preservation, as resource, and as habitus. And consider how these different temporal associations coexist and interact when related to development. So I'll go through these in turn. Heritage is perhaps most commonly regarded as a discourse and practice concerned with preservation. Preservation is ostensibly opposed to change. It seeks to stop time, to arrest the transformation wrought by its passing. Its goal is stasis, though often stasis in an aesthetic state of arrested ruination. As we've seen, this impulse to preserve is often motivated by a fear of change or anxieties at the rate of change, uh, particularly that this rate of change is accelerating. Understood in this way, heritage is a reactionary phenomenon, a demodernising impulse in which, as David Lowenthal has written, nostalgia for things old and outworn supplants dreams of progress and development. It is important to recognise, however, that preservation, whether of objects, structures or traditions, is not a passive state, but an active intervention. The natural state of things is to decay, and the work of conservators is to slow down this process by minimising the impact of various agents of deterioration over time. In attempting to resist or reverse processes of change, conservation and preservation experts affect changes of their own. Paradoxically then, rather than being opposed to transformation, preservation is itself a transformative process. The preserved object or practice is transformed in the process of past making. As critics of, heritage, of, of the heritage industry have argued, such transformed objects and practices are readily commoditized, leading to the construction of the past not as it was, but as consumers would like it to have been often safe, sanitised and simplified. While this has led to academic anxieties concerning the inventedness of traditions and the erosion of authenticity, heritage tourism has, in the meanwhile, become a very significant source of revenue. Heritage, as the commoditised past, may therefore be regarded as an important economic resource. Indeed, recognition of the economic potential of heritage is a major driver for many culture for development initiatives. In 2009, for example, a study by the Global Heritage Fund calculated that revenue generated by heritage tourism in developing and emerging countries and regions amounted to nearly 25 billion US dollars, and estimated that this was likely to grow to 152 billion dollars by 2025, based on the existing trends. And I've moved on to heritage resource here. But as we know, heritage has not only economic value, but may also be regarded as a resource in, in relation to other regimes of value. The idea of heritage has crucial temporal dimension, th sorry, this idea of heritage has crucial temporal dimensions too, insofar as the past is conceived as a resource of value to the present and the future, a driver or enabler of development. Past making thus becomes a resource in future making. Such an understanding of heritage temporality is central to the Council of Europe's 2005 Framework Convention on the Value of Cultural Heritage for Society, also known as the Faro Convention. As Robert Palmer, the Council's Director of Culture and Cultural and Natural Heritage at the time wrote, and to quote, heritage is not simply about the past, it is vitally about the present and future. A, her a heritage that is disjoined from ongoing life has limited value. Heritage involves continual creation and transformation. We must continually recognise that objects and places are not in themselves what is important about cultural heritage. They are important because of the meanings and uses that people attach to them and the values they represent. Such a vision of heritage as a resource at the service of contemporary civil society places value at the heart of the matter. But of course, the realm of value as uh, has already been said today, is also dynamic and contested. The past may mean different things to different stakeholders. For example, while the development of heritage-related ecotourism may seem like a responsible way of achieving broader economic objectives while sustaining communities' traditional lifestyles, this assumes that there is a compatibility between the pasts that the tourists will pay to come seeking and the pasts that local host communities actually live with. Even the journeys of ethically-minded and well-meaning ecotourists 
are often motivated, motivated by the prospect of experiencing a traditional, simpler way of life, a space of different distance from the modernity of their everyday urban existences. While ecotourism promoters in the global south market to the desires of these would-be adventurers, communities living in ecotourism destinations may themselves be caught in a double bind, their future development resting on their ability to remain in the undeveloped past, incarcerating, one might say, in the repetition of the ancestral invoked by Nora. While in fact they may desire a very different future, perhaps wishing to narrow the distance between their world and that of their visitors, seeking a share in their modernity. Here then is another temporal rep rep repetition, a continuity of unequal power relations between rich and poor, in which the international development industry, in conjunction with national governments and development partners, unwittingly determines the futures of ordinary people, denying them the capacity to aspire to futures of their own making. And um, here I'm very much drawing on the work of Arjun Apadurai uh, and his contribution to a book uh, called Culture and Public Action. Before turning to a more explicit discussion of values, I'd like to introduce a third heritage temporality into the equation. So I'm moving on now to habitus. Considering heritage as habitus moves us from a, con a concern with how we make the past to the manner in which the past makes us. Although Pierre Bourdieu's theorisation of habitus is rarely cited in the heritage studies literature, it provides a useful theoretical framework to consider both processes of social reproduction and social change that are key to contemporary heritage debates, and especially to the relationship between heritage and development. Rather like Nora's notion of pre-modern milieu de mémoire, real environments of memory, social and unviolated, that's a quote, Bourdieu describes habitus as an unconscious and unselfconscious, but nevertheless active presence of the past in the present. This is a heritage that is inveterate within us, a past, quote, in the course of which we were formed and from which we result. Habitus is a system of dispositions of internalised structures, schemes of perception, conception and action, acquired through processes of socialisation, which determines or mediates our actions and our attitudes, our sense of what is possible, our aspirations for the future. Habitus is a heritage embodied in ourselves, which is perpetuated into the future by making itself present in practices structured according to its principles. Unlike Nora, who perceives an irrevocable break between the pre-modern milieu de memoir and the lieu de memoir of modernity, a kind of breakdown in the reproduction of social memory without recourse to these artificial props, like museums or monuments, Bourdieu's model of habitus allows for the incorporation of change and transformation. Indeed, while Bourdieu has been regarded primarily as a theorist of social reproduction, Others have argued that social transformations and their limits and unintended consequences were core foci of his sociological project. Thus, while habitus, quote, engenders all thoughts, all the perceptions and all the actions consistent with itself, it is also undergoing a constant process of change over time as a result of both external influences and internal um, capacity for invention albeit within the uh, limits of what the habitus determines as imaginable according to its own operation. Rethinking heritage in terms of habitus foregrounds the relationship between social re reproduction and social transformation and acknowledges the primacy of the past in shaping futures and aspirations for the future. Importantly, however, this also foregrounds the political dimensions of this relationship including the mul multiple forms of domination that may be expressed in the force field of international development. Among the symbolic violences articulated in this context are hegemonic conceptualizations of time, space and society through which certain people have been placed in certain temporalities relative to the modernity of wealthy donor countries. On the one hand, that development, uh, sorry, on the one hand, the time that development beneficiaries inhabit is perceived to be uh, backward and inferior. So this idea that they need to be uh, helped to catch up. On the other hand, it's regarded as something valuable and endangered that has already been lost to modernity, 
their alternative, alternity must be preserved. As well as determining the nature of the past and legitimising this through expert knowledges of heritage professionals or the application of normative conventions, this has also determined the futures imagined for development beneficiaries, including how their past should be preserved or sacrificed or made into a resource in attaining those futures. Consequently, um, even when it is sought to be sensitive to cultural variation, development has tended to undermine the ability of people to, to determine their own pasts, and hence has inhibited the emergence of alternative visions of the future as expressions of those silenced heritages. <clears throat> so heritage values, development values. Much development practice is still determined by perceived hierarchy of needs, classically expressed by Abraham Maslow, in which psychological, sorry, physiological needs, food, water, and safety, shelter, health, security, are most fundamental and must therefore be uh, prioritised above lesser needs. Such priorities are forcefully reiterated in the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, that have determined the thrust of in international development intervention over the past decade. Applying this hierarchical logic, and given the persistence of these basic needs, it is unsurprising that museums and cultural heritage fall into the category of lesser needs or even dispensable luxuries. While people go hungry, lack shelter and clean drinking water, and have no access to basic health care or education, how can we justify devoting scarce resources to culture and heritage? Thus, even when the importance of incorporating culture into development practice has been recognised, cultural projects have generally been employed to support the achievement of these supposedly more fundamental objectives. Within development orthodoxy, culture and heritage have value only to the extent that they can contribute to the attainment of basic needs. A major theme of UNESCO's 2010 pamphlet, The uh, Power of Culture for Development, which perhaps many of you are familiar with, um, is the idea of putting culture to work for development goals. And Paul, I think, invoked that earlier in, in, in the, uh, at the beginning of the day. Culture, it is argued, can contribute to these goals by helping to build strong, self-reliant communities, and I'm kind of quoting from this document, and by making poverty alleviation strategies more relevant and effective through the integration of cultural approach approaches that respond to local specificities. The booklet addresses the MDGs explicitly, claiming that each of these goals is being addressed through its cultural programmes, which include promoting intangible living heritage as a means of income generation, strengthening food production through the adaptation of traditional land management systems, introducing local knowledge into school curricula, and running workshops to encourage women to play an active role in the development of creative industries. Elsewhere in this Power of Culture publication, it is stated that culture is a vehicle for economic development, for social cohesion and stability, for environmental st st sustainability, and for resilient communities. Notwithstanding these often repeated claims, as a UNESCO report on culture and development to the UN General Assembly, uh, I think from 2012, makes clear, the degree to which culture actually makes a contribution to such development goals is simply not known. Not, uh, not least due to the absence of appropriate indicators and measurement tools. That report um, to the UN General Assembly states that the UN and other agencies, quote, remain insufficiently informed by the impact of culture on development, including its contribution to the achievement of internationally agreed development goals. That culture-sensitive approaches and practices are neither consolidated nor fully accessed within development policies, practices and vision and that there is a need to take stock and consider the appropriate manner um, in which to integrate the cultural dimension into the development agenda in the future. Ultimately, the report acknowledges that despite considerable progress since the World Commission on Culture and Development in the 1990s, quote, culture remains ancillary in the development equation. The problem here is that by rendering culture and heritage subservient to supposedly more fundamental needs, Development denies the cultural subjectivities of those it seeks to aid and overlooks the importance of heritage in shaping those subjectivities. By, rank, by ranking material imperatives over cultural needs, it negates the entanglement of the economic and the cultural, artificially separating these two domains of people's everyday existence. <clears throat> 
One, respo one response to the lack of evidence that attests the impact of culture and heritage on development goals is reflected in the UN's demand for a data revolution for sustainable development to strengthen data and statistics for accountability and decision-making purposes. At the same time, there seems to be little serious attempt to address the likely incommensurability between the evaluative tools employed by development economists to measure aid effectiveness and the qualitative impact of culture on, well, on the well-being of society. One issue here takes us back to the matter of temporality and the typically short duration of development projects and evaluation cycles which are not compatible with longer-term qualitative research methods that are needed to track broader socio-cultural changes. But this misses a more significant question concerning the limits of translation between different regimes of value. Perhaps, as the economist R.J. Um, Klammer has argued, certain forms of cultural activity and experience have value that is beyond measure and simply cannot be translated into social or economic value. In considering the value of culture and heritage, there is a need to think outside the instrumental logic that dominates much development thinking. As previously mentioned, the issue of value was foregrounded in the Council of Europe's Faro Convention. While this moved the conversation forward, one might ask whether it goes far enough in de-instrumentalising the perceived value of heritage in relation to development. As with UN conventions, the Council of Europe's framework is, of course, ultimately determined by its political objectives, which, while couched in terms of consensus and commonality, reflect particular worldviews, the same worldviews that underpin international development. Thus, despite acknowledging that heritage in itself is simply, uh, sorry, is not simply a public good, and that cultural policy must take into, take into account the diversity of meanings, uses and values that constitute the cultural ecologies of different communities, it appears that only good heritage can be considered valuable to society, where the good of heritage is defined by its ability to support what are constructed as universal values within the prevailing hegemonic world order. What then, we might ask, of heritages or cultural practices that challenge normative frameworks resist dominant worldviews or imagine futures and values sorry or imagine futures and values other than those determined by the neoliberal hegemony to put this another way what would the relationship between heritage and development look like from the perspective of freedom put forward by uh, amartya sen in his well known critique of the dominance of economic econo economistic perspectives in development sen argues that freedom ought to be the main object of development, that economic betterment should be understood merely as a means to expanding the freedoms enjoyed by individuals and communities, and that a fundamental task of development intervention should be the removal of major sources of unfreedom. Whereas the stated objectives of many developments, including heritage for development projects, is the building of technical capacity, for Sen the goal of development ought to be the expansion of capabilities of persons to lead the kinds of lives they value and have reason to value. We might add that key among these freedoms is the ability of individuals and communities to determine their own values and their own aspirations, to be free to make their own pasts and their own futures. While Sen concentrates on the overt forces of poverty, social deprivation and repression that restrict self-determination, there are also more subtle forms of unfreedom that nevertheless have real consequences for people's lives, other forces that determine our cultural and economic values and desires. While we can recognise the extrinsic value of heritage as a resource that can contribute to a greater or a lesser degree to the emancipation of people from poverty for, uh, through tourism, um, appropriate forms of tourism, for example, perhaps its greater value is in the intrinsic capacity as, as, sorry, I'll just say that again. Um, while we can recognise the extrinsic value of heritage as a resource that can contribute to a greater or lesser degree to the emancipation of people from poverty through, through tourism, for example, perhaps its greater value is in its intrinsic capacity as habitus to generate possibly countervailing dispositions and preferences, enabling people to shape their own aspirations for the future. After all, as Sen has also acknowledged, there are multiple forms of poverty, 
while the development industry is sometimes interested in suggesting there are remediable cultures of poverty, it is perhaps more urgent to attend to the impoverishment of culture and cultural heritage that often results from inappropriate external interventions. And this isn't a, a repetition of a nostalgic desire for cultural diversity for its own sake, but a commitment to development as an emancipatory project. If we are to respect people's freedom determine, to determine their own futures, we must also respect their freedom to determine the meanings, values and uses of the pasts from which these futures arise. Accordingly, perhaps we need to rethink heritage preservation as the safeguarding as, of this capability. There is a place then within development for different conceptualizations of heritage. Heritage as preservation, as resource and as habitus along with the different regimes of values they represent. But attention must be placed, paid to ensuring a careful balance that, such that one freedom is not gained at the expense of another. While many claims have been made concerning the power of culture for development, I suggest that the true power of culture as a force acting in relation to development has yet to be fully explored and understood. Pairing the temporalities and values of, heritage, uh, of development with those of its ostensible opposite, heritage, provokes a new, new ways of thinking of, bo of both. Even understood as an instrumentalizable resource, there is a need to recognise that the greater value of heritage may not lie in its potential for income generation, but in the kinds of non monetized benefits that are often invoked in the culture and development rhetoric but are all too readily dismissed in practice as woolly, unquantifiable, and of a lesser importance in, in an assumed hierarchy of needs. Ultimately, however, we need to look beyond the economic and instrumental value of culture, cultural heritage for development and to explore its intrinsic value in reimagining development as a cultural project, and particularly as a culturally context-specific project. Our experience of the past is fundamental to our expectations for the future, and both the constitutive uh, of our present. A central contention here, contention here, then, is that development intervention is simply not tenable if it is not mindful of the cultural heritage of those it seeks to help, of the specificities of their collective memories, the histories that are inveterate within them. In disregarding or undermining the significance of their pasts, Development intervention erodes people's ability to imagine their own futures. At the same time, the museum and heritage sector can do a similar violence by overdetermining or reshaping the nature of those pasts according to its own external expert paradigms. In conclusion, then, I suggest that heritage and development can fruitfully exist in tension as paired opposites, providing a mutual critique and in, continu in, in continued conversation help enable communities to achieve their own past-making and future-making projects. Thank you.